My name is Bob Knadler. I'm with Hanson Professional Services. Uh, with me today is James Hackenberg. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about a case study. It's the commission of the uh, South Airport APM ITF facility. Uh, that stands for Automated People Mover and Inter uh, terminal facility, transportation facility actually, uh, at Orlando International Airport. It's a project that we've recently commit, completed commissioning on. And we want to go a little bit about this, the project itself, a little bit about background, what the owner was expecting, and you can get some of that perspective from James. We'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges, some of the expectations, and then some of the lessons learned. So it's going to kind of walk through the whole thing. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about the project itself. Again, Orlando Airport is growing. It's expanding pretty quickly. Uh, this particular project was laying the groundwork, the infrastructure for what's going to be their new South Terminal, South Terminal C. Uh, we're going to, again, share with you some of our experiences in commissioning this large project and uh, lessons learned, best practices. Again, the project itself was about a $650 million project, uh, but it's really setting the stage for what's about a $1.2 to $1.4 billion project, which is now currently starting construction. So letter, learning objectives that are here, uh, you have these in the handout as well. Again, the importance of having designated commissioning coordinators, particularly on a project that has a large project team and multiple CMARs, the importance of really regular tag up readiness or pull planning meetings to coordinate the work between the various contractors, the use of a cloud-based commissioning web application for really collecting, organizing, and disseminating all the commissioning information on the project, and then again, employing the lessons learned that we carry out of this project onto what's going to be a larger project that is currently starting construction. So an overview, we're going to give you a description of the project and the scope of our work, owner's team expectations, challenges, documentation, how it was organized, lessons learned, and then we're going to show you a little bit about what that next project's going to be. So description and scope. Orlando International Airport, you know, carries a tag designation, MCO. That stands for McCoy Air Force Base. And it, that was what the name was until 1975 when it was closed. Right now, Orlando International Airport is the busiest airport in Florida. It has overtaken Miami. It does right now, based on last year, just under 45 million passengers a year. Uh, that places it as the 14th largest airport in the country as far as passenger traffic, if you want to gauge everybody, everybody that came through Atlanta or goes through Atlanta, Atlanta does over 100 million passengers a year to give you a, a perspective. Fourth largest airport by area. What do I mean by that? I mean by physical area, how much land that they own or, or control. Uh, fortunately, Orlando has a large amount of land. They're the fourth largest by area. If you want to know the three larger ones, the two largest by far are Denver and Dallas-Fort Worth. And then, amazingly enough, Southwest Florida just edges out Orlando. They've got about 21, slightly over 21 point something square miles. So they're slightly larger in the amount of area. It is operated and managed by the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority. This particular project had about 335,000 square feet, uh, excluding, excluding the parking deck. The parking deck alone is probably in the neighborhood of about another 800,000 square feet. Uh, it includes the automated people mover. It's a four-story building with a mezzanine, as well as the ITF, which together they are at least 200,000 square feet of conditioned area. It also includes a passenger drop-off lobby the parking deck, as I said, six levels with 2,400 spaces for cars, and the central energy plant. Central energy plant, which is separate, was initially built with 1,400 tons at an N plus one. So what they have is three 700-ton chillers. We'll talk about that. 
but it's actually built to expand to 8,100 tons. And it gives you an idea, and that's part of, the challenge, part of the challenge that we had with it. So the commissioning scope really was an extremely inclusive scope, as you can see here by the systems. It included the building envelope, and for the building envelope, we had a subconsultant, which is Construction Moisture Consulting. They're out of Tampa. They've done a lot of work at Orlando International Airport, and they're very familiar, again, with the weather and the challenges in South and Central Florida. So they were our subconsultant on the project. All the HVAC systems and the controls, plumbing systems, fire protection systems, there were multiple fire pumps, electrical systems, there were multiple generators with paralleling switchgear, and then a lot of electronic safety and security, including fire detection, alarm, various security access control system, and video surveillance. So the owner's team and expectations, again, the owner, owner's team included a number of what we call uh, owner's authorized representatives, or OARs, and we, we would be considered an OAR as a, as a commission assaultant. James is an OAR, okay, and he actually oversaw the commissioning on behalf of GOA. Okay, so he worked with us. The AE team, and there were multiple engineering consultants on the project. The CMARs, and there were two large CMAR firms on the project. The work was divided. Uh, the CXA ourselves and the building envelope CXA, as I mentioned, which is CMC. And then there were a number of special inspectors and third party testing agencies that were involved in the project. The two construction managers at risk were Hensel Phelps and Turner Kiewit. Turner Kiewit was a joint venture. And the work was divided up into multiple GMPs. And this is one of the challenges that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So it wasn't one large project. It wasn't divided by buildings, necessarily, or by systems. It was broken into what they divided up as various GMPs. And for example, they were all given numbers. GMP-5 was pretty much the garage and the associated toll plaza. GMP-6 was a majority of the APM. GMP-9 was the CEP. 11 was the IPF. But between 6 and 11, there was a lot of crossover. And then 12 was a PDL, passenger drop-off lobby. Uh, there were a number of other GMPs. Some of them dealt with the site work, with the civil work in the development of that. There were multiple subcontractors by GMP. There was defined lines of demarcation between the GMPs. So for example, one GMP may, may carry so far in a building or do a, some sort of line of demarcation, and then the next GMP would pick up. Well, not necessarily all the subcontractors on this GMP were on this GMP. And that's why you'll see very shortly, we have a central chilled water loop that was actually installed by four different contractors, each responsible for their own part of the chilled water loop. And it was all installed at different times. They each had to do their own flushing. We'll, we'll talk further about that. Some systems were divided, as I said, and it not only included the chilled water loop, it also included the uh, smoke evacuation system for the atrium. So Bob, one, one thing real quick, <clears throat> maybe to help. Does everybody understand the alphabet soup that's up there for GMPs? CMAR stands for Construction Manager at Risk. There's two of them, so it was a joint venture that they split all those through. GMP meaning Guaranteed Maximum Price. And a lot of you would say, well, why would you go to so many Guaranteed Maximum Price projects? Um, the issue with the authority was their funding sources are based on different things, FAA funding, FDOT funding. So not all the buckets of money come out at the same time. So you end up having to break these based on the scoping that the CMs will do into the different packages. So that's why it kind of looks like, well, why would you ever do that? That's the reason. Okay. So one of the things, we talk about the contracting arrangement, and I understand you have black and white, but this is a color rendition, and if you look over on the left side, you can see all the different colors, and then you can see kind of the outline of the overview of the project. 
And again, those represent the different GMPs, okay, and what it included, what it didn't include within there. What's interesting about it, and you see that dotted line that goes all the way around the site there, it does break over here, but it just circles around that, that body of water, is that's the lead boundary, okay? So they were going for lead certification on a site basis, a campus basis, okay? As opposed to breaking the buildings apart and trying to seek lead for each of the individual buildings. And that is available under lead version four. This was going out for lead version four. So uh, owner's requirements and expectations. Uh, the airport has what they call a sustainability management plan. And that's kind of a, an umbrella plan that, that touches a number of things, not only energy efficiency, but it touches waste management, it touches uh, their vehicles, it touches many things. And, I think, uh, James, you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'll, I want to make sure I get it right. So I'll read the sustainability that the airport adopts, the authority adopts is, um, the goal is to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, lower the demand on potable water, preserve natural landfills, divert landfill waste, and support alternative transportation. Um, and so that's right out of their guidelines. Um, when it comes to the design concept that reflects that, they talk about a total environmental response complex that has high passenger convenience features low maintenance and operational costs, accommodates a high growth rate and reflects the unique character of Central Florida. So it really kind of so, embodies that, that master plan. So, so one of the things you're seeing here under owner's requirements, these all, this is only part of them, but these are kind of like the key requirements that came out of the OPR, all right? Second one is uh, campus certification. They were looking, again, for LEED version four certification. They were not looking for anything higher than that. They want to get certified, but at this point, they're not looking for anything higher than that. Quite honestly, we're still assimilating all the documentation. There's two LEED administrators on the project that have been going through, reviewing it, scrubbing it, to make sure that everything is there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Basically, it was set up for a 16, percent improvement on the energy side above the baseline, and the baseline was set up according to 90.1 2010. Again, this was designed a while back. And a 20% water reduction using the EPA water sense tool. So that's what their goals were. First phase, this is the first phase of a multi-phase master plan. And you'll understand that when we get towards the end of the presentation, how large this will be. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years down the road, okay? This, again, they're, they're planning an entire south terminal to eventually match up with the north terminal that they have right now, which is overloaded. Um, coordinate with outside transportation groups, because again, what we're building now, what has just been completed, basically allows for parking, it allows for drop-offs for buses, for taxi cabs, for other individuals. It's going to eventually have other modal. It's going to have a railroad coming in. And so right now, everything there is tied to the north terminal. That's where all the gates are until they get through this next phase and start adding gates on the south terminal side. Uh, environmental quality is absolutely critical. Okay, Again, we're in central Florida, which is much like south Florida. You're in a tropical climate, so to speak. So humidity is important. Continuity of airport operations, that's absolutely critical. I mean, they could not in any way, shape, or form interrupt the current operations of Orlando International Airport. Security and life safety systems needed to meet all state, federal requirements. That includes FAA, that includes the Department of uh, Homeland Security. Ensure integration with the North Terminal. Again, they had to have a link, particularly on their BAS system and controls and uh, security. And then, if you've ever been to Orlando, the city of Orlando brags about and it has what they call the Orlando experience. And so, in terms of the interior design of the facility, they wanted to show that Orlando experience. They're very big on the fact that when, as you can imagine, the, the vast majority of people coming into Orlando are tourists, they're coming in for the attractions, and they want to make and, and put on a good face as soon as they get off the plane. That's really important to them, 
and they, they stress that. So some of the challenges that we saw, and well, I guess I'd ask James, besides that, any other owner requirements or anything else that you would want to stress, you know? Yeah, I think kind of going back to what, what the authority recognized outside of the lead requirements for commissioning, they realized they wanted to have a robust owner's quality process um, and implement that as part of the overall design, construction, and close out of the project. Uh, meaning that's why, you know, commissioning got started in the design phase uh, with the OPR and the development of all the initial documents right. right on through into the construction phase. So implementing that owner's quality process was kind of the, the driver of this outside the lead. Um, they really wanted to make sure at the end of the day, one of the bullet points you had on there, Bob, was the operational readiness um, because that needs to go hand in hand with air, you know, airport operations. Uh, when you have to go on a certain day, there's a lot of implications if you don't hit those days. Um, and so for the authority, they wanted to make sure that all the, all the quality process steps were, were implemented right. to get okay. there. So again, I mentioned challenges, multiple bid packages, and that's a challenge because again, the lines of demarcation, James already talked about the fact that part of that was driven by funding but it did throw a lot of roadblocks to us. We'll talk about that. Multiple AE firms, uh, not only did you have an architect, you had a separate mechanical engineer, a separate electrical engineer. Uh, there was a number of, of people involved at that level. Installing contractors and subcontractors. As I mentioned, you had two CMARs, but each of these GMPs was separately bid, was separately negotiated, and so some of the subcontractors were different okay, on the various GMPs. So when I talk about the chilled water loop, we'll talk about that. When I say that there were four different mechanical contractors that were installing the chilled water loop, those were four different firms, okay. Uh, multiple submittal reviews, third party inspections and taste, testing agencies, um, there was a lot of that. Some of that is tied to warranties for all the various components of the envelope. Uh, but we did have a special inspector for the smoke evacuation system. Multiple coordination meetings. Again, this project had a schedule. Uh, Goal wanted it delivered on time, uh, but there were a lot of things that happened in terms of awarding the GMPs at different times. That meant parts of construction were ahead of other parts of construction, and uh, we had to try to coordinate that and drive the contractors and see what the critical paths were. Yes, they did their own scheduling, but again, there were things that were omitted. We'll talk a little bit about that. Submittal review process. Here's a diagram that talks a little bit about where we had to go through, because we use CX Alloy. It's a web-based commissioning software package. And we were able to convince the owner, and you can, I'll ask James in a minute to talk a little bit about it, but we were vehement about the fact that the amount of documentation on this project, we had to have a single repository for it. And so we thought that CX Alloy is gonna con contain all that. Unfortunately, there were several other software packages that were being used, okay? The contractors used Prolog, all the submittals came in through Prolog, um, they used IBM 360, and so we had to integrate our process with the CMARs and their process so that eventually you know, we, could, we could go through our reviews and then we could capture this, the accepted, the final approved submittals at the end. So in essence, without going through all the various boxes there, the submittals came in through Prolog. Everything went through the architect. The architect then distributed it. They would do, and every, the lead, um, the lead administrators, the, uh, and they were looking for, for their items, uh, ourselves as commissioning agents, the building envelope commissioning agents, the engineer of record, all those people were doing on simultaneous review, okay? All of our comments, anything that related to commissioning or building envelope commissioning got assigned. The beauty of CX Alloy is you can assign it to an individual. It was agreed upon all of our issues would be assigned to the architect. The architect took all of our issues, and then he looked at them, and if he could resolve them, he would basically respond to them, and we'd get the response back through CX Alloy. 
If he couldn't, he had to reassign them. He would reassign them to the CMARs or to appropriate subcontractors or to the engineer of record. And then eventually it would work its way back. But as you see the green box at the bottom there, ultimately we captured not only all of our submittals, which we had, or I should say our comments, which we had, but all the responses from the parties. Because again, we needed to have all those responses to get all those issues resolved. So it, it looks a little bit convoluted. It took a while to work it out, but we were able to do it. I'll ask you to comment on it. Sure, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the eye chart here and you kind of go through it, the, the rationale behind the parallel review, like Bob mentioned, between LEED and the CXA was there's contractually, there was timing in there for the CMARS, uh, right. 10 days to review submittals, for example. So they had to turn these around, so there wasn't the normal, like you could get a series review on these because the days right. would stack up and you wouldn't get the information back. So the rationale was, kind of like Bob was alluding to with CX Alloy, is that we were able to pull all that to a common repository and have a, a notification system that everybody could use. Now you'd say, well, why didn't everybody just use CX Alloy? Well, it's, it's hard to dictate as the owner to the CM, you're going to use this or you're going to use this because they have their processes that they want to implement and use their software. So Prolog was theirs on the inspector side, so AECOM and GCI also had their own uh, repository that they wanted to use, which was BIM 360. Um, and so issues were brought up in all these different locations, and so it was, it was a challenge to try and keep all those databases, one, up to date, and then be able to do the follow-up with it. Um, and with CX Alloy, like Bob said, you're able to tag individuals specifically with a company um, to be able to track those and close them, get, them, get a resolution to it. So the staggered progress of construction, again, there was a couple of GMPs that got awarded late, and it could tie back to, to funding. You know, Turner Kiewit got off to a slow start on the ITF. And uh, so, you know, you'd like to see the whole project brought along at a certain speed, a certain thing. Particularly, you'd like to see that chilled water system, in, you know, install the loop as well as bringing the plant up so you can get cooling as quickly as possible. Well, that, that didn't really happen. Uh, there was a delayed completion to activate the chilled water system, and yet one contractor by their schedule had to start some of the interior work. We were deeply concerned about it. We put multiple data loggers that were out there that were tracked on a regular basis, and we, and we collected all that. The little graphic that you see in the upper right, that's taken from one of those groups, it was on a day-to-day -day basis, of the temperature and humidity that we were tracking within the spaces. Um, IEQ was absolutely critical, and I can say that was driven by, by the engineer of record, by ourselves, and by the lead administrators. We were all equally concerned that we did not have high humidity that would compromise some of the interior work that they had to do before they could get cooling in the spaces. You had a central energy plant with three 700-ton chillers, uh, N plus one redundancy. The initial load that was calculated was 1,400 tons, but they needed at least a third one. As a variable primary pumping system, which by Cysticon, okay, but they also have some tertiary pumps out at the ITF to help distribute the water as well. Um, anybody that's familiar with Cysticon will know that in their standard package, they use PLC controls. One of the things we caught early on was, you know, that the integration that they wanted with the DDC system, and they actually work with Cysticon, and it is a DDC-based system. They, they actually pulled out the guts of their PLC and went with DDC. Um, it's at least 60% of the cooling capacity of this plant is currently available uh, on an emergency basis through generators. And then the chilled water poop, uh, piping loop, which is really important, uh, the loop is sized for the ultimate build out, which is 8,100 tons. So you've got some large piping there. And that presented a challenge, we'll talk about it in a second, in terms of fleshing it out. So the chilled water loop was constructed by four different mechanical contractors under different GMPs. Each was responsible for their own flushing and treating of their system, and once they got theirs done, 
you know, they would not open it up until everybody else was done with theirs. The real challenge was to maintain the required at least five feet per second on the flushing uh, in the 30 inch underground mains because the existing pumping system wasn't going to be able to provide that. The contractor had to come in and provide additional pumping to get that velocity up. Otherwise, we weren't confident that they were going to get the proper flushing. So I'll ask James, do you have any more comments on this? We'll, we'll throw up the graphic here. This is actually a graphic that was developed. Okay, Hensel Phelps developed it, and the colors actually show the responsibilities of the different contractors for their part of the chilled water loop. Okay, you know, not only not only the loop itself, but the piping within the buildings. Okay, and that was part of the challenge. With you'll see in the middle there that the, what I'll call Aqua, which was the ITF kind of was all the piping fed through the ITF and fed the garage, fed the APM. And as Bob mentioned, the ITF, for a myriad of reasons, actually got late. That, that GMP got started later than any of the other buildings, as, uh, the other GMPs. So the challenge was, as you got to this flushing plan, just like they highlight here, you had to do it in all these different phases with different contractors at different times. A lot of coordination had to happen between them. So the chiller sequence of operation was another challenge in that the engineers that designed it had projected a peak cooling load of 1,400 tons, and they selected three 700-ton chillers. Unfortunately, when this first came online, and they also calculated when they did it that the minimum load would be between 150 and 200 tons. Unfortunately, when the systems were brought online, and really the entire uh, facility wasn't really being used at that point. They didn't have occupancy. We actually had an actual load, it happened to be during the winter, so to speak, of between 50 and 100 tons. So we had a real challenge here with excessive cycling of the chillers, potential for surge, and we actually, you know, we, we spoke about possibly installing, you know, a pony chiller, a smaller chiller, uh, the owner did not want to do that. The engineer of record came up with an alternate winter sequence of operation, which would basically drive the, the water temperature down, shut off the cycle, let the water temperature float up a little bit. Again, as we're watching the humidity, so it actually would allow the chill temperature to vary between 40 degrees and 52 degrees. So it did allow for the proper operation of the plant without damaging the chillers, it kind of played havoc with us because, you know, we're trying to write functional control, to, uh, functional tests that are based upon the design entering chilled water temperature, and on any given day when we're out there, it could vary. Okay, so we had to had to take a look at that. Outdoor ventilation airflow was another challenge. They had multiple air handling units tied into these big, common gravity. Uh, plenums, okay? And then what happened is, as with any facility, no matter how they laid out the ductwork, when the guys got in the field, they had all kind of uh, challenges. They had to reroute the ductwork. There were additional turns, additional bends, additional transitions, and it really increased the pressure drop on, on the negative side, and in some cases, greater than five inches. We were having static pressure sensors that were tripping out the air handling units because of that. Um, design airflows had to be adjusted, return air damper ranges had to be adjusted. Uh, we had to go back to the engineer of record. Uh, and in some cases, even in the first pass, we had insufficient and discharge static pressure, uh, which challenged the test and balance contractor to deliver the right amount of supply airflow talk any more about that. Yeah, I think with this, definitely double, triple check your shop drawings, right? Right. And system effect is a very real thing when it came here. Um, don't think that was totally appreciated when, when we went through it the first time, but it, it ended up being a big problem. So um, I mentioned numerous third-party inspections, and on the envelope side, there were numerous inspections, okay? And a lot of them tied to warranties. Uh, and you can see some of the different systems that were commissioned and, and also inspected by third-party inspectors. You know, you have a lot of systems 
particularly roofs and things like that, where before you're going to get the warranty, somebody from the manufacturer has to come out and certify that it was properly installed, and he has to sign off on it. It doesn't really matter what the building envelope commissioning agent says. It doesn't really matter what anybody else. They want one of their own people to take a look at it. So documentation, so we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, I did mention, again, we use CX Alloy. It maintained all the MEP, FP commissioning as well as a building envelope commissioning documentation. Uh, besides, if you're familiar with it, besides the tabs for checklists, uh, functional tests, that, they have a massive, uh, they have a tab called file section. We made extensive use of that tab. And we created a number of folders under that tab. So, these are just some of them. You know, we put all the AC temperature and humidity logs, the, the contract drawings and specs, various tests that the contractor conducted as far as duct leakage, as far as uh, hydrostatic pressure tests, um, the commissioning plan and specs, various equipment startup reports, all the lead documentation as it resides right now is kept on CX Alloy in its own folder. Uh, a number of photos, a number of third party envelope inspections. Again, we convinced not only GOA, but we convinced the lead authorities that if we keep all this data out there, it's gonna be easier for them when they're looking for something that they have to upload or address USGBC with. So uh, this, is, this is how we captured it. I'd ask you, James, you know, how, do, how did you feel it worked? Yeah, I think for, as you go through those bullets and you, you say specific information you're looking for, whether it's the mechanical contractor or whoever you're trying to identify, those other systems that I mentioned, BIM 360 and uh, Prolog, right. they're used for a totally, the, the information that somebody would be looking for is totally different. Um, whether it's, it's from an inspection log or just submittals and RFIs, totally different. So as, you know, when you identify a person that's, that has right. to be responsible for closing this out, great spot to have it. <laughs> right. So uh, just a, a brief summary, we had 581 checklists it was a mix of envelope checklists as well as MEP checklists. Um, you know, there's a clip of one of them right there. Uh, what we did is we identified them as we tagged them by GMP and the building name. So you see that right there, that happens to be one GMP6, APM, at the bridge. It was uh, at the ele south elevation, glazed aluminum framing sections. What the BE uh, Building Envelope Commissioning Authority did was they did some representative checklists for each elevation on each building for different materials, okay? Uh, the envelope checklist, as I mentioned there, included the roof system components, thermal insulation, waterproofing, wall panels, glazed aluminum framing. You can see the checklist, all the HVAC equipment, the generator, so on and so forth. So there's a number of uh, checklists that were out there. Field observation reports, again, those were kept out there. There's right around 200 plus field observation reports. Uh, and that's uh, exclusive of some of the meetings and meeting minutes, exclusive of our tag up meetings, readiness meetings, and full planning meetings. These are just field observation reports, okay? Uh, test, there were 213 MEP tests, okay, created, functional tests. A lot of those are integrated system tests. So by that I mean it's not just one particular component. These involve an air handling unit, it's associated VAV boxes, it's associated exhaust fans, et cetera. Uh, this, this excludes the envelope testing, which was done by a third party. The envelope testing, that was developed between our BECX and they had a testing authority, which happened to be Terracon, and they developed their own testing outside of CX Alloy but the results of that test, of those tests, I should say, were then uploaded into CX Alloy. So in other words, they came back in, they're in the file folder section, but they chose not to try to write them within CX Alloy for those tests. Um, there was a special inspector that oversaw the smoke evacuation as is required by code. Um, as I talk about, there were numerous envelope tests uh, Goa has a history, uh, if there's one thing that they are absolutely livid about, um, and you'll kind of see it in the pictures, you'll, if you know, uh, 
the airport, the existing airport that they have, has a number of skylights. Uh, part of that Orlando experience is getting as much outdoor lighting, ambient lighting as possible. They really want it to bring the outdoors in. Well, skylights, notoriously for Goa, have been a thorn in their side as far as water leakage. So there was a extensive uh, testing on those on the new facility on the South Airport complex. But and you and that's that. the one thing everybody remembers. It didn't, wasn't you were on time, it wasn't that you were under budget, right. they'll remember that it leaked. Um, and that's what sticks with everybody. Right, and that was really important. And, and there were a number of leaks, and, and the consultant had to, had to recommend, you know, they had to get it repaired, they had to retest it and retest it. Uh, documentation, construction issues. We had over 1,161 issues during design as we did design reviews. Again, it's a mix of MEP and, and uh, envelope. We had over 908 construction issues from site observation reports and tests. Uh, the building commissioning, uh, uh, building envelope commissioning authority actually did their own punch list because they were so concerned about some of the issues with the roof, with the skylights, that they generated separate punch lists, which again were kept on, on, on the envelope. Now they had a part of some of the issues that were from field observation reports, but they went above and beyond, again, because of their concern. Lead four documentation, again, I don't know if you're familiar with lead V4. How many people in the room have done a lead version four project all the way through, okay? So again, the requirements of of creating a current facility requirements, operation and maintenance plan, that had to be done. Uh, an ongoing commissioning program, we had to create that as well. Uh, this is all part of what the lead administrator reviews, makes it, any edited corrections or recommends them, and then ultimately uploads. Uploads, actually they just are uploading the uh, table of contents, right? Correct. Uh, if you were to upload all the documentation from this particular project, if you were to print it, if you were to print it, it would probably be a couple stacks of free ring binders, okay? So, Dave, at this point, you're not looking for hard copies, or have you No, decided? I'm shipping them back to your office, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's a massive amount, and, and, and actually, actually, the lead administrators had to go to USGBC, if you're familiar with that, they have a 100 megabyte limit for any file that you upload. They actually had to increase that a couple times. It, it, I actually call US, USGBC and have them increase that so that we could upload some of our larger files. But in some cases, they're, being, they're allowed to only upload a table of contents or some representative tests in that. So lessons learned, let's talk about that. Again, document handling. Um, you know, James talked a little bit about, and I mentioned too, uh, and, and this is kind of common with a lot of projects in as much as you have a construction uh, manager or a general contractor that wants to use a certain software package. We, we say we're going to use CX Alloy and there has to be some meeting of the minds. I mean, we, we may have to download some information from his package. We may have to upload some to his, but then he has to work with us. It, it's really important and I think James will talk about this, the CMARs and all the subcontractors were obligated to use CX Alloy to address issues that were assigned to them, to fill out and complete checklists and, back up and, and upload those. I mean, there was, there was no relief given to that. They had to learn and use CX Alloy. CX Alloy is very intuitive. It's not difficult to learn. And uh, once they got on board with it, they didn't have any problem. I'll ask you to comment on that. Yeah, I think so from the prologue side of it, what the CMs like it is, is it's a repository for documentation, right? Not right. necessarily. For BIM 360 and for CX Alloy, the follow-up function of that, to be able to tag people and have emails and reminders and, and information flow coming back, there's a feedback loop that right. kind of happens with that. It's kind of the key, otherwise it just sits. Right. So uh, again, massive amount of documentation. CX coordination with the CMARs. We actually specified in the commissioning plan and in our commissioning specifications that each of the CMARs had to have a dedicated commissioning coordinator. We wanted a one-point liaison between ourselves and the building envelope commissioning with 
the, with the CMAR and with all their subcontractors. We wanted a one-point contact. Um, now, that happened, okay? And in one of the CMARs assigned one individual, and he was responsible both for coordination with the, uh, on the MEP side and on the building envelope side. The other CMAR, uh, which now, again, this is a lessons learned, he broke it and he had one liaison for all the envelope issues and he had, who was more familiar with building envelope and then he had one MEP commissioning coordinator that was more familiar with building systems. Going forward, that's what we're gonna specify because um, I, thought, I thought they did a respectable job, I thought they did it, but the, the individual that had been tasked by one of the CMRs to do everything uh, it, it was just overwhelming for him to try to follow up on all the envelope issues as well as all the MEP issues. I mean, would you? I totally agree. And so what happens in the lessons learned for, for the CXA and the owner side, the way the CM is structured for their staff positions, they tend to want to put a quality person who doesn't necessarily have MEP experience or building envelope experience. Right. They're a quality person, it's great, but they don't necessarily have specific, like Bob right. said, specific in these areas. Uh, for coordination, and it, and it tends to, they suffer. Right. So, uh, division of work between the GMPs and contractors. I don't know how much we're going to be able to control this going forward, but we're going to try to do everything we can. Uh, the chilled water loop was constructed by multiple contractors. I've said that multiple times, but the other issue that our building envelope uh, consultant had was that there were buildings where the primary expansion loop was actually divided between multiple subcontractors. And uh, that division uh, uh, between their subcontractors, there was really a lack of coordination and a lack of quality control. And that re they really struggled with that. And so going forward, as we say below, you somehow have to cr keep critical systems under one CMAR, okay? And if you do have to break it, between multiple GMPs, make sure on those critical systems that you have the same contractors on every GMP so that they can follow through. Yeah. No. The, the airport has one controls contractor. He's been there forever. He knows the airport inside out, the North Terminal. And, uh, and so that was not even a negotiated thing. I mean, he was brought on board he worked with all, all the subcontractors and all the uh, CMARs, and, uh, and, and so to our credit, that was, that was an advantage. Right, okay. yeah, and having an extension of an existing system worked out. Right, yeah, so better. the controls weren't. Those questions yeah. the fire alarm? Fire alarm was a legacy system as well. Yeah, that was also a legacy system. Uh, tag up and readiness meeting. Again, be realistic with schedules and times. Uh, ensure all stakeholders at meetings. That was a little bit of a problem we had a couple of times uh, in as much as um, early on at some of the meetings that we would have liked to have the controls contractor and the tab contractor at, uh, the CMAR said, you're too early, we don't need them in. But we really would have liked to have them for their input and what they needed. Uh, they, they brought them in, in our opinion, a little bit too late and uh, that became an issue. Uh, we also want the subcontractors and ven uh, vendors to identify their key requirements. We'll talk further about that in a second and to plan for contingencies. Uh, there were a number of scheduled dates that came and went. I mean, that's just, just the nature of the beast. And uh, as, you can, as you can well imagine. Coordination between mechanical electrical controls. Again, we had a separate mechanical engineer and a separate electrical engineer. These are two separate firms. And even though I think they, they did their best to coordinate, you had situations, for example, where um, the, there were co controllers that didn't reflect either the correct or the proper power source. We had uh, power going to controllers that was routed through an adjacent disconnect switch. So if you drop the power to the piece of equipment, like an air handler, you were also dropping the power to the BAS controller. And we, you know, we, that just didn't make sense. Uh, we also had cases where the BAS was not provided with a separate input for fire alarm. 
So if something went off, you didn't know whether there was a failure of the unit, if there was a fire alarm, you didn't know what it was. They needed multiple sets of contacts and they didn't have them. The mock-up wall, this is a great story. Uh, the architect, I think, did his best. He put in the specific specification section, 014339, visual mock-up requirements required for the CMARs to submit shop drawings, but he didn't go into much detail. So when the time came, uh, the CMARs didn't know really what they wanted to do. So the architect went back and created this drawing. You're seeing it very small up here in the upper right-hand corner. And he created an 80-foot by 24-foot mock-up wall that basically demonstrated all the exterior conditions for the building. The contractors came back and said, we'll build that for $250,000, because that's not what we thought was gonna be our markup wall. Well, it went back and forth, and we ended up with that little thing that you see up in the left-hand corner there. Uh, and by the time it was done and constructed, it didn't really bring a lot of value. So we've, we've revamped that now. But a lot of the testing was done in the field on the building itself. Yeah, I think there's the, the inherent problem here was, just like Bob said, you get the, the architect goes to a certain point. With curtain wall in particular, there's delegated engineering that happens as part of that. So at that point, when they go out to bid, sometimes they don't know who the actual low bidder is going to be to be able to design some of the right. performance-based testing around or, or actual detailing right. around that. Um, and it just becomes caught up in the washer. Right. Business. So chiller sizing. Um, again, to take a harder look at what that minimum load would be and actually, you know, a recommendation had been made early about a smaller pony chiller, it was never accepted, but again, you have to take a hard look, not at only what your maximum load is going to be, but what's your minimum load going to be and how can you accommodate that, particularly if you're only putting in large chillers. Outdoor air control, and we've talked to them repeatedly about this is that you either need to put in a dedicated outdoor air system or some way to pressurize those plenums, some kind of supply fan, to try to suck in from a gravity plenum source the amount of air just is not going to work. And so we, we've talked about that and, uh, you know, on, on the one coming up on South Terminal C. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yep. uh, checklist management, again, it was very... <laughs> We're overlooking, you know, like I said, about 580 checklists. Uh, subcontractors were working on them. Uh, we tried to monitor what percentage complete they were, not only overall, but by various disciplines. Uh, it was very tough to do. We, we used different tools to do it, actually. Um, and then, as probably everybody in the room knows, as you get closer and closer and closer to the end of the project, you're starting to see them get pencil whipped which means that, you know, you've beat on me enough, yeah, I'll fill them out. I'll go home tonight, they're all gonna be filled out tomorrow for you. You don't have to worry about that. So we've gotta look at a way to better assign responsibilities and signature. Right now, you can't have them signed, you have to print them out, and, and they're signed on a paper. We're looking for an electronic way to have them signed that we can verify that, and that's something we're working with CX Alloy on. IP addresses and BAS integration. This is really important. Um, no matter how many controls, integration, and interoperability meetings you have, and you go over and over this stuff, it seems, it seems incredible that in the 11th hour, in this particular case, it was a power monitoring system, power expert, that would tie it into a number of switchboards and a number of uh, distribution panels that, uh, not only had not been programmed and set up, they never really requested the proper number of IP addresses that they needed. And again, it was the responsibility of the owner to, to provide the addresses, but if you don't ask them until the 11th hour, it becomes an issue, so. Yeah, channeling on this project was a, was a, was a problem as far as the, you know, the documentation, how you get that back through the system, um, so that GOA IT is aware of what you want right. to do and patch back. So uh, CMMS integration, this is the other thing that uh, it was never a requirement for us to, to basically, we had a lot of data in our checklist that would go into their, you know, computerized maintenance management system, which they use IBM Maxibo. But unfortunately, our checklists weren't set up to easily extract it. 
now that we know, we can reconfigure our checklist, but that's something else we're gonna work with CXL on. The beauty is, why would you want, if you have all that data in your checklist, and it can easily be downloaded and input into CMMS, why would you wanna go out and capture it again? Why would you wanna manually import all that stuff? So we're looking for a closer integration on that. So next, where do we go from here? So that project's done, okay, it's online. Next project is what they call South Terminal C Phase One, approximately a $2.1 billion project, the second largest infrastructure project in Central Florida. What's the number one largest infrastructure project in Central Florida? How many of you people have been to Central Florida and driven along I-4? Okay, <laughs> so you know that all of I-4 is, is basically tore up. They're basically widening the entire section of I-4. That project's slightly larger. Landside terminal, about 630,000 square feet. Airside terminal, three level with concourse, approximately 700,000 square feet with the initial 16 gates. Ground transportation facility, about 240,000 square feet, parking garage expansion, another 2,400 spaces. Okay, it's designed, it's under construction now. If you go out there, you'll see this massive amount of area that's in, and they are working as feverishly as they can. I was down there a couple weeks ago at two in the morning. I was out there for a generator at parallel switchgear test, and all I heard was kathunk, kathunk, kathunk as they were driving the piles. They drive piles 24 hours a day, round the clock, multiple. Uh, okay, so that's phase one. It's the first 16 gates. So uh, the current capacity of the airport with the South, Air, uh, South Airport complex, which is currently online, okay, is 45 million passengers. And what did I show you at the beginning? Last year they did 44.6 million passengers. That's why they can't build fast enough right now. Uh, designed, for, designed for phase two, which was gonna be, which is another 16 gates, it's after this phase one, uh, was going to be authorized after phase one completed, which, James, you would say, the contractors say that phase one, the first 60 gates gonna be done in the middle of 2021. Goa says it'll be done the end of 2020. So you got a six month gap there between what the owner says it's gonna be done and when the contractor says it'll be done. For, right. <laughs> so, so phase two, the trigger for phase two is gonna be 50 million uh, passengers. That was gonna be completed in 2025, 2026. They've already authorized the design. They've already said, we've gotta go. We can't wait, we've gotta keep moving. So that's phase two. The current demand is 45 million projected capacity when South Terminal C phase one opens, again, end of 2020, middle of 2021, in that range, will be 50 million passengers. However, at the rate they're growing, or growing, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a challenge to get it done, okay? Um, they're getting a lot of tourists come in, there's a lot of international traffic. Uh, the North Terminal right now cannot accommodate the large Airbus that United Emirates and... A380. Yeah, the A380. It, 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 does anybody know what an A380 is? It actually has two levels of passengers all the way through there. And so the entry is, what, about three and a half stories in the air? So, yeah, three separate gates. Yeah. So, so part of this construction on phase one is swing gates that will actually allow for that plane to come in. Um, so above and beyond. So this gives you an idea of what their plan is for South Terminal C. So you have, um, you kind of see in the middle here, there's what we just did as far as the South Airport complex, but they're showing you eventually, and you can see all these gates that'll eventually be there. It'll go from, six, it'll go from 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and then ultimately 120, mm -hmm. or how many? Yeah, 120. 120 gates eventually, but now we're out at 2050, or? You say I, that. <laughs> I don't know, it, it, it's gonna be out there, but they got a couple hotels in there that they're gonna put. Uh, they're gonna do another central energy plant. Actually, this next phase has another central energy plant because they're, they're saving the additional capacity for the one we just built 
for the first hotel and some others. So that's where we are. Uh, and that's it. Well, there were, be, we, were, we were only in, our, our meetings were just commissioning meetings, but James, why don't you talk about how often you were in meetings and how many meetings they had every week between GOA and the CMARs, and then between the CMARs and between the subcontractors. Yeah, the roll down, it felt like, there, we had meetings just to have meetings, uh, it seemed like. Uh, the, you know, the roll up would have been like Bob described, where we had a, a CX specific meeting once a week. We also had a meeting with the owner we also had meetings with the CM that rolled down to their subcontractors and then to their second tier subcontractors. So yes, it was a lot of coordination, a lot of moving parts, a lot of, a lot of names to learn. It was a, it was a good time though. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a, a massive amount of people on this project as far as what you would deem the project team, okay? Any other questions? Yes. Operational readiness. So okay. yeah, it's a separate, as far as the, the airport's concerned, they have their operational readiness matrix processes that they'll run through. It, it kind of dovetails into this commissioning process. Right. There's a little bit of overlap um, when you talk about, you know, is the lighting controls, you know, right. HVAC, and then you get into the tenant fit out, who's, who's actually going to occupy the space, and then that begins, okay, when's operational readiness going to be done so that they can move in? So there's a period there, if you would look at the Gantt chart, a little bit of overlap. Right. By finishing with operational readiness. Okay. Anybody? Yes, in the back. How long was the schedule? What was the original schedule? I mean, this thing. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that out loud. <laughs> I don't. It, I honestly don't remember when we started. It would have been um, the the project. The I th I think the project was originally going back to the start was originally scheduled to complete. Uh, sometime last summer, like June or August of 2017, uh, it, really, it really came on board. In other words, they opened it up to the public. Was it in December or January? February. February, okay. So they didn't open it until February. Um, and there's, there still is a little bit of residual work going on out there. It, it, it's, it, it, uh, it's a large project, and, and, and again, this, this South Terminal C phase one, okay, is exponentially larger than, as you can tell, exponentially larger than what we just completed. So, yeah, right. Design, build, right? Yes, design, bid, build. Oh my gosh, I don't know. It, it, yeah, that had to go back. The design on that was HKS, and that yeah, had to go back 2014, 2013, 2014 is when that started. Uh, the next, that was HKS uh, with a couple of local engineers in the Orlando area. The next phase that I just showed you that's under construction now, uh, the architect of record is uh, HNTB. HNTB. Uh, the design architect is Fentress out of Denver. Uh, and the engineer, there's a, if, if you saw, if you saw the uh, matrix for this next project, they have actually broken all the various buildings and either sub-buildings into various architects, engineers. Uh, the overriding one is Fentress and HNTB. Underneath them, the overriding engineer yeah, is- Yeah, so you got concept architect right. is Fentress, then you have a production architect who's HNTB. There are 42 subs underneath them for and this is design. Formula, just for design. This is design, 42 sub uh, architect engineering firms. That, that's how big the matrix is on the design side. So you can kind of imagine once the CMARs, and the CMARs are actually going to be the, the same two CMARs that we have same here. Same yeah. So Hensel Phelps and Turner Kiewit will be the two CMARs for the next project. Um, and they'll, they've broken it up so that the two biggest pieces, pieces, the land side and the air side, each one of them has one of those, and then they have other sub pieces underneath. Um, so it gives you, gives you somewhat of an idea. Any other questions? Yes.
Yes. You're right. You're right. Winter sequence? Yeah. Yeah, it was, tra it, was, it was set up and programmed. We did have trend logs run. We also watched it, what the temperature did. Um, I mean, it, to make sure that it was, it was semi-stable in the way that it operated. I think, I think what I would tell you is that the, um, because it came online with absolutely no occupancy, no load at all in the winter, that's why the 50 to 100. The engineer's more comfortable with that once this is up and running, you start getting more people moving through it, that you're going to ramp up and you're going to have that 150 to 200 ton load. That's what they, that's what they expect. Yeah, you had two issues. You had the, the, the phasing and, and occupancy issue, and then you had, I'm going to use a dirty word here, you had value engineering that happened as part of this as well, right. um, which kind of cut into those, those tonnages. Right. And how they, how they mitigated that is through the Systicon system operates more on a flow, a constant flow, um, which was driving the chillers into right. a, a delta P issue. Um, when they were able to identify what times or, or times of the day or periods in which they're going to get that low load, they were able to reduce flow as part of the Systicon system, which is trying to do wire to water, which was part of the problem. It was trying to be as most efficient, but was causing a trouble on the chillers. As we reduced that flow, we got into a period where we were able to just move water and able to use the volume as the load is circulated through the system, keep it up and running. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's. Yeah, there's certain parts of that sequence that actually drops the 42 degree water down to make 40 and keeps dropping it lower and lower to be able to do that, keep it going, keep the humidification going.